Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. You are going to listen to a telephone conversation between two people, Hannah and her father. As you can see, there are four alternative answers, A, B, C and D, for each question 1 to 5. You have to decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the appropriate letter. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the test will begin. Remember, you will hear the recording only once, so answer the questions as you listen. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, double nine two eight four six. Dad, is that you? Anna? Dad, I'm phoning... The line isn't very clear. Yes, I know. I'm on a mobile and the signal isn't very good. I'll see if I can move. Is that any better? Yes, that's much better. Just uh, don't move. I'll try not to. Have you found a place to live yet? Yes, I think I have at last. Wonderful. I'm relieved because I'm fed up looking. I didn't think it was going to take me three weeks. It hasn't been easy for you. I suppose it's the beginning of the academic year and you have all the new students looking for places as well. Yes, that's one reason. But this place is also full of new technology companies and there are lots of young people looking for somewhere to live. And you know what that means. Higher rents as well. Yes, much higher. Well, tell me. How much is it? It isn't cheap for this area. It's £400 a month. That's much more than you had expected. Yes, it is. But I can't face looking any more. I want a place where I can put my things instead of living out of a suitcase. I don't want to stay in this hotel any longer. I guess not. So, what's the new place like? Oh, it's really, really nice. Oh, good. It's in a very quiet street. It's a second floor flat with one double bedroom, a large living room, kitchen and toilet and bathroom. Sounds very nice. Oh, it is. And guess what? Yes? It's got a small roof terrace looking onto the garden at the back. Great. And it's big enough to have my plants and a small table and chairs. Brilliant. Before the speakers continue their conversation, look at questions 6 to 10. As you listen to the second part of the conversation, complete the numbered spaces 6 to 10. For questions 8 to 10, write no more than three words for each answer. Now, uh, what's the address? It's 22B White Hart Road. 22E. No, 22B. B for banana. Right. And it's White Hart Road? Yes. And the postcode? Oh, you know, I don't think I've got it. OK. No, here it is. It's EX159RJ. This line is bad. Is that EX50? 
No, it's EX15. Uh, OK. Uh, I don't think I know the road. It's a side road, but you do know the area because it's off Garrett Lane. Oh, right. Uh, which end? The other end from the stadium. So, it won't be too noisy then? You can still hear it from here when there's a match on. Hmm. When are we going to see you? Well, I was going to come down on Friday evening after work, and then we could bring my things by van on Saturday afternoon. I want to move all of my stuff out, to give you and Mum more space. We'll need to hire a van, then. It's OK. I'll pay for it. No, no, don't worry. It'll be a gift from your Mum and me. Oh, Dad, it's OK. I... No, I won't hear of it. We'll pay. All right. Thanks, Dad. And if you're taking everything, we might need to hire a container lorry. <laughs> oh, Dad! I'm only joking. <laughs> I know. I'll hire the van for the Saturday, then. I can pick it up first thing in the morning. Right. And then return it in the evening. Are you sure you don't want to stay overnight? No, I'd best get back the same day. You know what your mum's like. She'll only worry. If I remember rightly, it's about three hours by road? Yes, roughly. Well, if we leave by lunchtime, we'll be there mid-afternoon. OK. Then a couple of hours to unpack. Then? We could go to a nice restaurant round the corner. Definitely. My treat. <laughs> You're on. But I'll have to be away by about 7.30ish. OK. Right then. Um, Mum wants to have a word. I'll see you Friday. Bye, Dad. I'll hand you over to her. Uh, bye. That's the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a man talking about living and working on Trinidad. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, I'm Steve Pinfold and I'm here today to tell you about my gap year, which I took about 20 years ago. Unlike many students these days who go travelling or get some work experience between school and university, I decided to do something completely different after finishing my degree. I applied to work for a charity organisation. What it does is it sends people with particular skills to countries where those skills are needed. Apart from having some experience teaching English to summer school students, I didn't have any particularly useful skills, I thought, but luckily I was still accepted. I had to find the money for the flight, but you get free accommodation, I stayed with a family of five. And you do get paid, but not much. It's a bit like pocket money, enough to get by. I worked in an orphanage and taught English at a local school. Where was I? Well, originally, I was going to be sent to a village in India, but at the last minute, the organisation decided to send me to Trinidad. Now, this is a fascinating place. It's an island in the Caribbean. Well, in fact, the country is actually two islands. The smaller one is called Tobago, which is connected somehow to the word tobacco. Anyway, there I was, a young white guy living and working on an island which is mostly a mixture of descendants from Africa and India. 
The Africans were originally brought over as slaves, and the Indians came later as indentured workers. That means they agreed to come for a specific time, but many of them stayed. There are also some Trinidadians of Chinese and British origin, though the native inhabitants were basically wiped out by colonialization. I myself felt completely accepted and had the time of my life. The language everyone speaks is English, so there was no problem for me there. But some concepts don't quite translate. They're pure Trinidadian. There's the term liming, for example. Which means sitting around watching the world go by. Also, there's the famous carnival when the whole island is taken up in playing mass. For a whole month around February or March, it depends when Easter is. Everyone's busy preparing costumes, practicing calypsos, soca and steel pan music, and most importantly, partying. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. When the actual official carnival starts, it's days of twenty-four hour dancing in the streets. In Trinidad, it's called whining. You've probably seen this sort of thing on TV, in the more famous carnival in Rio, or even at the Notting Hill Carnival in London. Many people join bands, each one of which has a theme. For example, the Sea or Jungle Fever. And they have costumes designed and made to go with the theme. These can cost a thousand dollars for the king and queen of each band. They're incredible. The whole city is a non-stop party zone, full of color and sound. It's serious too. The bands are in competition, and the winner gets a million dollars. Sorry, I got a bit carried away with those memories. Back to my real job there. The orphanage was called Saint Augustine's, and that's also the name of the place where it was, Saint Augustine, a town just outside the capital city, Port of Spain. I didn't have any particular job description, just to be with the children and tell stories, sing songs, and play games. Oh, and we also went camping in the jungle once. <laughs> I could tell you a few stories about that particular escapade. Every time I arrived at the gate. Kids would come running towards me, shouting with big smiles on their faces. The younger children seemed fascinated by my blonde hair and loved to touch it as if it was something miraculous. The English teaching I did two days a week in a primary school for six to eleven-year-olds. The kids may have been poor, but they all wore neat and clean uniforms and were so respectful and enthusiastic. I've now been teaching for many years in different countries, and I still think those were the best students I've ever taught. What else did I do while I was there? I swam a lot. Can you imagine what it's like swimming with dolphins and with pelicans diving into the sea right next to you? More seriously, I trained to be a Samaritan. That's someone who listens and supports people who have problems with their lives. Overall, what I took from the experience was a sense of being in another culture, or rather, cultures. As humans, we all share many characteristics, but we express ourselves in various ways. In Trinidad, there are lots of different communities and religions, and so many different kinds of festival to see: Hindu, Muslim, Christian, as well as some rather mysterious African traditions. There are quite a few Rastafarians too. Trinidad is, as Americans are fond of saying of their own country, a melting pot where everybody is greeted warmly. Go and see for yourself. I'm not sure how it's changed since I was there, but I'd love to find out. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute. 
to check your answers. Turn to Section 3. Section 3. You are going to hear a conversation between Bill and the counselor. You now have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen to the conversation carefully and answer questions 21 to 25 by circling the correct letter A, B, or C. Hello, Bill. What can I help you with? Well, I was talking with a friend of mine who's doing a medical course and he said that before I start taking sleeping pills, I should see you. I see. Well, I can't prescribe any medicine, Bill, and I prefer not to encourage anybody to take sleeping pills. What I can do is to help you look at why you're not sleeping. Okay, but I think it's because I don't know how to handle all the work. I found that new students find college very different to school. The biggest difference seems to be that you have to get used to working more independently at college. And this can be difficult to pick up straight away. You can feel that you're not quite in control of it all. That's right. I mean... With only a few lectures and tutorials each week, it looks like an easy workload, but then you suddenly realize that there are assignments, tests, and exams. I know I'm not the only one. I really prefer to work quietly in the library where the resources are, but its hours just don't suit my work and sleep habits. Yes. Having a lot of time to manage and having to arrange to get everything done and still have time left over to relax and feel refreshed usually needs careful planning. Yeah, that's right. I know. But it's hard to get started. My medical mate said you can help with getting organized, and I sure need it. Okay, then. I need to get a few details about your timetable and any other commitments. You can put them all down on this form if you like. Now you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Listen to the second part of the conversation and answer questions 26 to 30 by completing the notes below. Write no more than three words for each answer. Now, Bill, what's your main concern? Well, what really gets me down at present is that the exams are coming up and I don't feel confident. I know you've spent a lot of time preparing, so let's look at the actual exam itself. No matter how much preparation you do, it doesn't really count if you don't plan how you will time yourself to ensure you get to answer all the questions. Usually there will be some guide on the exam paper that will tell you the relative importance of each question, its contribution to your total mark. I see. So if I feel organized at the start, I can be more confident. Exactly. So once you've worked out an overall plan, and this can be done quickly, you need to make sure you know what each question is asking you to do. As a marker, I know what answers I expect to a question. Then you need to address the question, not just write down what you know and hope the marker will appreciate the hard study you've done. Yes, that's important. I can see that markers are looking at the questions, not trying to guess what we know. Yes. And the third point to keep in mind is that even if you know the topic well, you should leave time to go back and check your work for content. There may be an important point you have missed, 
or not explained as much as you wanted to. And at the same time, you can look for errors, including any obvious ones in grammar. OK, thanks. It's really simple in many ways, isn't it? This is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a woman giving a talk at a popular science convention. She is describing research into artificial gills designed to enable humans to breathe underwater. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. In my talk today, I'll be exploring the idea of artificial gills. I'll start by introducing the concept, giving some background and so forth, and then I'll go on to explain the technological applications, including a short, very simple experiment I conducted. Starting with the background. As everyone knows, all living creatures need oxygen to live. Mammals take in oxygen from the atmosphere by using their lungs, and fishes take oxygen from water by means of their gills, which of course, in most fishes, are located either side of their head. But human beings have always dreamt of being able to swim underwater like the fishes, breathing without the help of oxygen tanks. I don't know whether any of you have done any scuba diving, but it's a real pain having to use all that equipment. You need special training, and it's generally agreed that tanks are too heavy and big to enable most people to move and work comfortably underwater. So scientists are trying a different tack. Rather than humans carrying an oxygen supply as they go underwater, wouldn't it be possible to extract oxygen in situ that is, directly from the water, while swimming. In the 1960s, the famous underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau, for example, predicted that one day surgery could be used to equip humans with gills. He believed our lungs could be bypassed and we would learn to live underwater just as naturally as we live on land. But of course, most of us would prefer not to go to such extremes. <laughs> I've been looking at some fairly simple technologies developed to extract oxygen from water, ways to produce a simple, practical artificial gill enabling humans to live and breathe in water without harm. Now, how scientists and inventors went about this was to look at the way different animals handled this. Fairly obviously, they looked at the way fishes breathe, but also how they move down and float up to the surface using inflatable sacs called swim bladders. Scientists also looked at animals without gills, which use bubbles of air underwater, notably beetles. These insects contrive to stay underwater for long periods by breathing from this bubble, which they hold under their wing cases. By looking at these animal adaptations, inventors began to come up with their own artificial gills. Now, making a crude gill is actually rather easy, more straightforward. You take a watertight box, which is made of a material which is permeable to gas, that is, it allows it to pass through inwards and outwards. You then fill this with air, fix it to the diver's face, and go down underwater. But a crucial factor is 
that the diver has to keep the water moving so that water high in oxygen is always in contact with the gill, so he can't really stay still. And to maximize this contact, it's necessary for your gill to have a big surface area. Different gill designers have addressed this problem in different ways, but many choose to use a network or lattice arrangement of tiny tubes as part of their artificial gills. Then the diver is able to breathe in and out. Oxygen from the water passes through the outer walls of the gill and carbon dioxide is expelled. In a nutshell, that's how the artificial gill works. So, having read about these simple gill mechanisms, I decided to create my own. I followed the procedure I've just described, and it worked pretty well when I tried it out in the swimming pool. I lasted underwater for nearly 40 minutes. However, I've read about other people breathing through their gill for several hours. So the basic idea works well, but the real limitation is that these simple gills don't work as the diver descends to any great depth because the pressure builds and a whole different set of problems are caused by that. Research is being done into how these problems might be overcome, but that's another story, which has to be a subject of another talk. <laughs> Despite this serious limitation, many people have high hopes for the artificial gill, and they think it might have applications beyond simply enabling an individual to stay underwater for a length of time. For example, the same technology might be used to provide oxygen for submarines, enabling them to stay submerged for months on end without resorting to potentially dangerous technologies such as nuclear power. Another idea is to use oxygen derived from the water as energy for fuel cells. These could power machinery underwater, such as robotic devices. So, in my view, this is an area of technology with great potential. Now, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I yes, um, lady at the... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening. Thank you.